It's couches and porches and kitchen tables. It's stories shared and moments worth remembering. It's hoping and praying and taking chances. It's jokes and laughter and shoulders to cry on. It's questions and answers and I don't knows. It's knowing you don't have to figure it all out by yourself. It's messy and imperfect. It's giving and serving and growing better together. It's life and we weren't meant to do it alone. Life is better together. It's hard to believe, but it has been a year since we changed the name and moved in this direction. And probably it feels like, I don't know, five, because the last few months have felt like forever. So it, you might be like, wow. I, I, I looked at it and went, this is a good opportunity then to revisit and go back and then say, how are we doing? Where are we going? What is the next thing for us as a church? So Thrive was all built on John 10.10, 10, this idea that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And if you're not careful, you can make this verse say all sorts of things it doesn't say. The whole point is that a life rooted in Christ is a life that thrives. It thrives in hard times, it, it thrives in good times, uh, no matter what. When, when you follow Jesus and when you make him the Lord of your life and he is your shepherd and you are following him, it changes everything about our life. It changes the trajectory and it leads us to a life that thrives. That's where the ultimate idea came from, that that's the type of life we were called to live, that's the type of life that we are supposed to be living. And so out of it, our mission, and I've tried to go over this over and over again because I don't want anybody to miss this, is that we are all about leading people in a growing relationship with Christ. That's what everybody here ought to think about as you're part of this church. That how am I doing growing in my relationship to Christ? Am I helping anybody else grow in their relationship with Christ? Or am I just doing whatever it is I want to do and forget uh, all the things that God has called me to do? So that's our mission. That's what we're all about. And everything we do, we'd like to see this happen. That people would get led into a growing relationship with Christ. And here's a statement I made, and it was a long time ago, um, and I'm just going to be honest. I didn't even remember it. I had to go look it up uh, because it was all about why, why this idea and why this name. And that's because our community of Indianola doesn't need another church, but Indianola needs Thrive. It needs a church who wants to reach the nuns, the duns, and the undones. Those are the three groups that I introduced you to uh, last year. The nuns are, I have no church, I have no church affiliation. Um, that just continues to grow in our country. Whether you understand or not, that just continues to grow. That group gets bigger all the time. They, there's none. I'm, I'm not affiliated with anything. I'm not associated with anything. That's the biggest movement. That's the biggest push of people in our own country. None. None. Now, none doesn't mean they, they have nothing they follow. They all have things that they follow. They have things that they care about. They have things they give their lives to. But when it comes to a church, and most of us are uh, probably remember when church attendance was, was big and everybody did it, and now it's so different. And that's because the fastest growing group, the biggest growing group right now are the nuns. And then there's the duns. The duns have had a church experience that didn't go very well. And, and that could be, you know, the, the church had, had a fight or a split, uh, people had issues with something, uh, whatever it might be. Those are the duns, okay? And that's where if you talk to somebody, you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I go to that church across town, right? I go to this church, I go to that church. And then just follow it up with, when's the last time you went? Oh, I don't know. Right? Been a while. When was Easter? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember. Okay, Christmas. Right? And, and that's just because there are people who are done. They're just done. They, 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 you know, have enough stress, have enough things going on in their life. They don't need to go to church and get more. So they're just done. They've had some sort of experience that just led them and pushed them away. That is why, you know, that, that's why it is so important that leadership be following Jesus. Because when they don't and they fall and they crash, they take a lot of people with them. They ruin a lot of things. They destroy a lot of things. And that's why it is so important. And then the undones, the people who are just going through unbelievable things. 
And we've seen a lot of this currently. And part of it's why uh, I was so excited when we got the opportunity for the Heel House. Those are people who are undone. They are people who are totally undone. They've had something happen in their life and it has just caused them to spiral to the point where they're at and they have no home and things are just totally out of control for them. And we have an opportunity with what we're doing to actually reach some people who are part of that undone group. And so going back and reviewing all that, this is, this is where I wanted to kind of start tonight. And that is what we've learned in the last three and a half months. Because whether or not you, you understood it, you've all learned something about yourself. Sometimes it's not good stuff. I'll admit that. I learned some stuff I didn't, I didn't like, you know. I learned some stuff about myself that I didn't know, I thought, or I felt, or uh, I would deal with things like this. I mean, you just... Nobody saw this coming. Nobody's ever dealt with something like this before. So uh, it's, a, it's a chance to go back and reflect and look. And you should have learned something about yourself in the last three and a half months. Even if it's bad, it's okay. Okay? Even if it's bad, even if it's negative, even if it's like, I can't believe I felt that way. I can't believe I got so worried. I can't believe my anxiety that I didn't even know I had just got out of control. It's okay right? It's okay. You've learned that now. And now you can say, okay, how do I then deal with it and move forward? Same thing's true for church. We learned some things over the last three and a half months. We learned some things that are important as we move forward to say, okay, we know this is true. We know we did this well, and we know this is a huge area in which we need to figure out and deal with, okay? Here, here's what we've learned in the last three and a half months. That we moved from a church with one location in one spot of town to one with many locations located in a lot of homes, uh, a lot of living rooms, uh, right, with people sitting on couches. That just, no, you know, right, we didn't even think about that. Okay? We didn't even think about that. We've had no discussions in elder meetings about, yeah, we need to do online ministry and we can reach all these people. Online ministry just got to kind of pushed on us and we got to do this. And so what we learned was, oh my goodness, we've, we've went from a place where if you want to be part, you came here, to now there's all sorts of locations. To where, okay, now we need to invest in equipment and we need to keep this going and how can we reach people better? So now there's all sorts of new questions because this is a huge thing that changed and became different about our church. The second thing is that generosity flourished, okay? Where, where we had lots of conversations before, I will tell you about finances and, okay, how big is our deficit now and how short are we? Um, for whatever reason, everybody got generous when things shut down. And, and it was amazing because I had no idea what to, to expect. I really didn't. And it was, it was amazing as I talked to some of my pastor friends, it was either feast or famine. You know what I mean? Either the church did well and people gave and they were generous and they made sure stuff, things kept going and things were happening and, and finances were taken care of or it was like just nothing. It just all dropped off and now they're worried about closing their doors because there's no finances, there's no money. What we learned was for whatever reason, all the struggles that we've had before and how many times we've talked about it, we have a very generous church. I guess it just took a pandemic to kick us all and get us moving in that direction where we became givers. And it, it wasn't like even we could, you know, pass, pass a basket and make sure everybody gave. It was that people had to do it from home and people had to mail a check uh, or they, you know, they had to go online and go, how do I do this online giving? I've never done this before. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing how people stepped up and gave like we could have all along. But for whatever reason, during this time, generosity has really flourished. It has really done well. But here's the third thing, and this is where I'm gonna spend all my time tonight, is our need for community. Here's what we found out, that we have a big hole and we have to work on. And that is our need for community. So in other words, if the building's closed like it was for 88 days, okay? If the building's closed, it's like community almost stops, right? There's just, there's, 
there's online and people watch services. It was, we tried to get people to engage. Um, we did some Zoom prayer meetings and would have, you know, maybe eight to 10 people the most be part of that and, and join in those. But the idea of community taking place, even in smaller settings and small groups just didn't happen because it's something we've never been able to totally figure out. So what I'd like to do tonight is propose a vision for how we can actually begin to do this, how we can actually move in this direction because we have no idea. This is the new normal. I've said it before, this is the new normal. And we don't know if we're gonna flip a switch and go back to whatever it was before, but we've seen some great things in this new normal. So now it's our time to figure out how do we do this thing called community? How do we do it better? And how do we help get people connected into community? Because after all, what, what did Solomon remind us? That two people are better than one. Two people are better than one. And being in a circle and being in a group and being with people who care about you, who are going in the same direction as you, who can encourage you and help you is something that we all need. And let's just be honest, you found out during this time who some of those key people were that you called up and said, I'm not doing very well with all of this. And you were able to have conversations with and be very honest with and talk about your frustrations, uh, the things you were anxious about. You found out some of that. But for the most part, we have to figure out as a church, how do we create that? And how do we foster that? And how do we let that happen? So Acts chapter 2, this is one of my favorite passages, because Luke, as he gets to hear the stories of the early church, and that's before he was on the scene, he shows up later in the book of Acts uh, as a person right there with Paul on his missionary journeys, he's got to rely on all the eyewitnesses who were there from day one. And he had to sit down and talk to them. Hey, how did it go? What was it like? How did it work? What, it, what was it like to be together? How did, how did, it, how did it go and, and how were things? And so here's what he records for us about the early church from day one when it started on the day of Pentecost. And this is Acts chapter two, towards the end of the chapter, beginning verse number 42. And he says, those early believers, now this is thousands of people, okay? They, just trying to give us an idea of who they were. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. You've got to understand, the only thing that was available at that time is the Old Testament. What's the Old Testament in our Bibles? It was on scrolls. Uh, people didn't have them in their homes, okay? There's no cell phone apps, right? There's none of that stuff. So you don't have that. So now you've got to rely on faithful people to teach you. And so those men that were with Jesus took over that teaching. So they devoted themselves to that teaching. Hey, teach us the right thing, walk us in the right direction. And to fellowship, this idea of community and being together. They devoted themselves to each other, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. They saw things that, you know, Jesus did, but they never saw anybody else do this. And for some of those early believers who didn't experience Jesus, they saw some things that were incredible, okay? All who believed were together and they held everything in common and they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Hey, there's someone who has a need. I got an extra piece of land, I'm gonna sell it and we're gonna give it to them and we're gonna help them. And they just did that. That just came out of this idea of we wanna be together, we wanna help one another, we wanna serve one another. Every day, every day, they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house and sharing their foods with glad and humble hearts. They just did life together. Praising God and having the goodwill of all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Every day. Because there's something really attractive about this idea of doing life together. There was something attractive about that that brought other people in as other people were led to come to know Christ and led in a growing relationship with him. 
every day they just start adding more and more people to this group so that Luke doesn't get very far and nobody's counting anymore because we can't. There's just too many people. There's too many house churches. There's too many people in different places. We have no idea. We just know this thing is moving. This is on the move. God is doing something great. And simply put, the early church did life together. That's, that's all they did. They took life and they did it together. They weren't thinking about, oh, yeah, but I have all this going on. It was a very different time. I understand that. But they did life together. They looked at each other and said, what would it look like if we just did life together? And we helped one another and we encouraged one another. And, hey, if you have needs and I have extra, I'm going to give that to you. And nobody was making them do that. They were just being led by Jesus to do and take care and do life together. Okay? And... I'm just telling you, this is our next step. We, we are going to try to figure this out. Creating community and doing life together. Um, I think what happens sometimes is that we assume because we are not a large church that, oh, everybody knows everybody and it just happens. It doesn't. Community doesn't just happen by accident. It has to find a place that planned and prepared, and it happens in those places. And there's lots of those places that we already have. And I'm going to tell you what I think our, our biggest obstacle is, okay? It is making the simple complex. This is not hard. It's just we almost make it hard. We almost make it. Every time we've had discussion about small groups, it's... And you don't understand my calendar. I I don't have time for anything else. And it's going to be every week. And and what day of the week? And what do I got to do? Right? We just make it so complex that it's almost then out of reach. And oh, we can't do it. This isn't hard. I think we've just made it hard. And I've made it hard because I haven't understood a lot of it either. Uh, But I got a chance before everything hit in January to sit down with the pastor in Des Moines who uh, is a part of the network that we joined, uh, the the network called ARC, the Association of Related Churches, who kind of helped me see this in a different way, and that they've had some great success because they have figured out, we just need to make this simple. We're making this way too complex, making this way too hard, and so everybody just has this natural, oh, I'm going to check out, it's just... It's too hard, and I don't have room in my calendar. Ed, you don't understand how much I got going on. I understand. And you think this is going to be another night, another time. I don't know. And we've just made this hard. So I'd like to try to tonight present that I think there's a way to do this simply and to get you thinking about this. That's, that's all I intend to do tonight, is to get us to think differently about this than we have thought before so that we can look, look forward and look for opportunities where this can happen and this can take place. And, and simply put, is your life is your group. See, there's already things you are doing in your life that can be included in community. That isn't about adding something. It isn't about jamming up your calendar and putting something else on there. It's already happening, it's already taking place, or it's something you've already been talking about joining and doing, and what happens then is our life, the life we live, the life that we're doing, ends up helping to form a group, helps us to form the community of people that we can be around who are going to help us and encourage us and move in that direction. See, this is a lot simpler. Okay, then, okay, what, what, what night of the week, and how long do I got to do this, and, right, and, and all sorts of other things that make it so complex, everybody just throws up their hands and goes, oh, well, I guess we can't do this. It's way far simpler than that. And that's what I want to return to, making this simple, that your life is your group. And so earlier this year, And I've already heard from some of you how incredibly helpful it was. You knew you needed to start the new year off by working on your finances, okay? And so you joined a group. Now, yes, that was more formalized, and that met once a week, but that was a group where you did what? Said what? 
I got I to work on my finances. I need help moving in a better direction. And so you came together and you were part of that based on a simple need and community got to be formed out of that. Some of you are in things already that can very easily be things where spiritual conversations and encouragement can already happen. It's something you're already a part of. It's not I gotta separate this night and I've got all this other stuff to do, okay? It's simply creating opportunities for encouragement, accountability, and leading each other into a growing relationship with Christ. That's all this is. You can do this with a fishing pole in the water, by the way. You can do this there, right? I, 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 some of you already do that. You get together with a couple guys, you go fishing. You can actually do this there. Really? I can do, yes, yes. Does you get together and do other activities and other things? All it's talking about is taking those opportunities and using them maybe as a way we've never used them before for encouragement, accountability, and leading one another in a growing relationship with Christ. You're already with people, you're already doing things. Why not take those opportunities you're already doing in, you, in your life where you're doing life and doing it together with somebody else. So that there's encouragement, accountability, and leading one another in growing relationship with Christ. You can do this with a fishing pole in the water, with a line in the water, um, ready to catch your next fish. Right, and I, I, I think most of, most of the guys could find time, right, to go fishing. Right, that wouldn't be a Really? I got to put down my, t really? You're going to make me go? No, it'd be totally different, right? It'd be very different. But it's just taking those opportunities. And I'm not good at, at, at talking about what all of those could be. But it's creating those for the purpose of these things. It's just taking those and turning it around. And we've done some of these th things before. Um, we've done different groups that have been really focused on certain things. What if we made those opportunities for encouragement, accountability, and leading one another into a growing relationship with Christ. So here's the question I want you to think about tonight, okay? Where are you already doing life together? Where are you already doing life together? Where I, 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 Ed, Ed's not adding something to your calendar. Ed's not forcing you to come to a building um, on a certain night for so many hours Okay, where you already doing life together. We just want to create those opportunities. We want to look for those opportunities. And those opportunities don't have to be 17 weeks, 30 weeks, right? They're, they're when they can happen. They're in seasons where that takes place. Probably some of you do not want to go out in December, right? And cut a hole in the lake and put a line in, okay? And probably don't want to do that. So it's seasons. It's seasons of our life, and it's where we can actually do life together. So that's what I want you to think about. Because we're going to revisit this in probably six weeks. Okay? I want you to already think where you're doing life together. That doesn't require coming to a building. It's just already a part of your life. It's already a, a, a hobby you enjoy, an activity you like to do, or something you've been wanting to do. And it's using that for encouragement, accountability, and leading one another in a growing relationship with Christ, okay? Because life together is one of the best ways to grow in our relationship with Christ. Possibly we struggle growing because we're just not doing life together with somebody else who could help us, right? Because sometimes we just, we just get off, we drift, and we start thinking things we shouldn't, and someone can just love us and encourage us, and, and it's a safe enough group to say, guys, I'm struggling, you know, I have this going on, and I don't know what to do about this, and, and you're able to talk and share and help one another do life together. That's where I think we're going to have the best impact leading people into a growing relationship with Christ, if we can help one another do life together. So that's all I want to pray for us for tonight. I want us to pray that we would, that God would open our eyes to the opportunities we already have, that are already part of the seasons of our lives, and that we would use those, and that we would ask him to help us to see where those can be used 
so that we can actually start doing life together and, and see an incredible impact of our own growth and the growth of the people around us that God gives us to do life together. So let's pray. And let's just ask God to open our eyes to the opportunities we already have. That's where it's going to be the biggest difference for the life of our church. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight, I, I pray that we've taken something that's been complex and out of reach. And we've seen that we've just made it hard. And it didn't have to be hard. It didn't have to be difficult to do life together and find some encouragement and accountability. And Jesus, here's what I know. We all need that. We all need that encouragement and we all need that accountability. And we all need help from time to time to stay on the right path and do the right things. And Father, during this time, I, I think we discovered how much that was missing in our lives. Yeah, there were some key people we called, but we just weren't doing life together with, with anybody else. So we had to wait for a building to open in order to start gathering again. And we were missing out on one of the most important things I think you have for us in order that we would grow in that relationship with you. So open our eyes to the opportunities that are already around us that we can utilize in the different seasons throughout the year of our lives that we would do life together and find the encouragement and the accountability we desperately need so that our relationship with you continues to grow. Help us to see that happen as a church and help us to help everybody get connected and help that for us to be our goal, to help everybody get connected throughout the year into a group where they can find encouragement, accountability, and being led in a growing relationship with you. We just submit that into your hands tonight, Jesus, and ask you to help us to see that happen and help us see that take place. And, and when we do, we, we will give you all the glory because our own efforts have just messed us up. And we need you to step in and lead us and direct us and get us back on track to doing life together. We thank you, direct us, guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we will see you next week. And for the next couple of weeks, Pastor Ryan's going to be leading us uh, in the word.